Good morning, TFH Oakland. Pastor Jules here. So good that you're rocking with us. We are starting a new series out of the book of Ecclesiastes. If you're not familiar with this book, it's a book of poetry. It's a little bit melancholy, uh, but uh, for the next few weeks, we're going to be unpacking this book because I feel like this book really resonates just with where we are, not only as a church, but what people are feeling and just what's going on in the atmosphere. And so it is so good uh, to be with you guys this morning. And uh, I know that God's going to speak with us and speak to us. And so uh, it's exciting days. We're living in exciting days and God's doing amazing things. So as you're getting ready, uh, we're going to jump in because this has been kind of a crazy season for our family. Uh, We have just purchased a home from our family member. And uh, it's been an amazing experience because we are like Chip and Joanna Gaines. And we are literally tearing up the house. Uh, Literally, we're trying to move in as soon as possible. We're doing massive, crazy construction. And uh, a couple of days ago, we literally were moving all of this junk and trash out of the house. It was so much trash and ripping up walls. And I had a few of my friends, we were help, they were helping me. And we were moving all this trash. And I remember we, we got to the dump and we went to push all of the trash out of the trailer. And in the process of doing that, man, we just hit this wall of exhaustion. We were tired, we were complaining, we were sweating. My friends were looking at me ready to kill me. I felt like Jesus was about to be crucified. They were upset that I would put them through this situation. And literally with dirt and dust and debris in every area of our bodies, it was an intense moment. And I raised my hands up to God and I said, why, Lord, all of this toiling? Man, have you ever had those moments of exhaustion where you feel like you just are doing something and you forget the whole purpose behind it. You see, for for me in that moment, it just was just trash. It was this unending trailer of of debris and chaos and frustration and, and funky smells. But it was hard to have that big picture moment. It was hard to see what was the purpose behind this trash that me removing this trash out of the house would actually get us prepared for the second phase of putting walls and insulation and plumbing and electrical. And and from there, then we could do cabinets and all of this other stuff. But in that moment, the trash was overwhelming and it felt like there was no hope. It felt like this was too big of a task to accomplish. And I feel like there are moments in our life and in this season where it seems like a pandemic, racial division, and it seems people are in this moment of uncertainty. We have to ask ourselves these questions. Is what we're doing, is it worth it? Is what's going on in our daily lives, is this worth it? And I'm not trying to depress you. I'm not trying to to push you over the edge. What I'm trying to do is to get us to a place that as we look at these few verses of Scripture today, that we're going to see this author by the name of Solomon, who I would like you to consider if he was around today, he would probably be one of the dopest MCs and producers. He literally would have this empire of music. And we're going to look through his life because Solomon was the son of David. And he amount all of this wealth. He, he had all of this cash. He had all of this jewelry. He had all of the, the fame and the fortune. And he had wisdom. He had built this empire and he was chosen by God to establish the temple of God. And Solomon, full of all of this wisdom, he begins to ask a few verses in the book of Ecclesiastes. And he begins to say, what do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? What Solomon is saying is this, it seems this overwhelming, hot, intense life that we live of working under the sun only to get some kind of gain. And I looked at that word gains. He's not talking about gains in which you get in the gym, but gains is means to obtain, secure something profitable. It means to secure the bag. And Solomon is saying, what do we gain if we secure the bag? What do we get out of it if we have more wealth, more possession, more work, more hustle, more bustle? What comes at the end of it? And as we begin to unpack Solomon's view, we realize that he has this weird juxtaposition when he when he looks at God. Like God is present, but he's really not sure how to interact with God. He's not sure what God would ask of him and how to involve God in the questions that he has concerning the issues of his soul. But Jesus said in Mark chapter 8, verse 36, Jesus says, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world, yet loses his own soul? You see, Solomon, this king that is over God's people, he inherits the kingdom. 
And he wants to lead so well. And God shows up and God shows up to Solomon. He says, Solomon, if you could ask for anything, what would it be? And Solomon asked for wisdom. And in that wisdom, Solomon starts to see the futility in life. And he goes after possession. He goes after pleasure. He goes after knowledge. And he fills his soul, but he ends up being frustrated. Throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, we see that Solomon uses this phrase, a chasing after the wind. I know that's a weird hand gesture. It's like magic hands, a chasing after the wind. But what he's saying is, is this, is that in our pursuit of trying to gain that next level and it slips through your fingers, is not life worth more than chasing after the wind? You see, if Solomon were around today, his rap name would be the preacher, be Solomon the preacher, because that's what he refers to himself in this text. He calls himself the preacher. He, what he's saying is, is this. This is kind of like uh, existential. This is his, his uh, AKA the preacher, a person that is addressing a group of people wanting to serve them and help them and give them wisdom. I mean, if you were to look at Solomon, if Solomon was around today, he would have been a mogul. He would have been into fashion. He would have been into architecture. He built homes. He had vineyards and gardens. He would have been on the cover of HGTV magazine. He would have been friends with Joanna Gaines. He would have been friends with Drake. He would have been hanging out with Oprah. Like Solomon would have been at that level of status. And Solomon, having all of this fame, all of this fortune, what did he learn through these things? And here's one of the things that we see in Solomon. It's a really weird, I know people give Ecclesiastes a bad rap because it's like, oh, it's so morbid, it's so melancholy, but actually there's something so beautiful in this text. Because the way that Solomon is approaching this text is this, I've done everything. And this is what I've discovered. And God, it's not that he's an atheist, but you could see that Solomon is struggling with his understanding with God and God's involvement with humanity. And in verse 17 in chapter 2, this is what Solomon culminates these first, two ver- these first two chapters with. And he says this. He says, after I have created all of this wealth, all of these luxuries for myself, he says, I hated life. <laughs> because the work that I had done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all things and I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to one who comes after me. And who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish, yet they will have control over the fruit of my toil, which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. My heart began to despair over all the toilsome labor under the sun. For a person may labor with wisdom, knowledge, and skill. Then they must leave it all to another who has not toiled for it. This too is meaningless and a great misfortune. What do people get for all the toil and anxious striving which they labor under the sun. All their day's work is grief and pain. Even at night, their minds do not rest. Does this sound familiar to you? What Solomon is saying is, man, there's this addiction to wanting more, and we're consumed by it. And he says, but what is the purpose of having more? He says, a person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their toil. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, God, who can eat and find enjoyment? Solomon says, everything culminates to the simplest pleasures of recognizing God and his involvement in our daily lives. Here's the big idea. Is this. No matter how much we have, we were made for more. No matter what we possess, no matter how much we have, we were made for more. There is an insatiable thirst in our souls to want to move beyond what we see on a daily basis. The first thing that we have to understand is this. We were made for more than monotony. We were made for more than just going through the process. In verses in chapter 1, 8 through 11, Solomon begins to break down this concept that the world is on a cycle. The preacher speaks about this unending cycle in the world. He begins to say there are moments where the sun rises and the sun sets and there's this cycle that we seem on and we wake up and we toil only to go to bed, only to do it again. And it has this morbid disposition of viewing life. And life is cyclical. But this is where we have finite moments to see the beauty before things begin to fade. You know what I get excited about? 
a cycle that I get excited about is a cell phone. I don't know about you, I'm weird like that, but I love when the new cell phone drops. Like I will do research. I will go on YouTube and I will look at all of the YouTube stars that are literally talking about this cell phone. I'm putting the phone uh, release date in my calendar, which Apple always drops right around my birthday. And you're probably thinking to yourself with phone, Android or Apple, it's Apple all day. But one of the things that I started to find, like my desire, my passion concerning phones and, and technology is it seems like it's just kind of repeating the same thing over and over. Like we get a new phone, but the different case, a little bit changes in the hardware and kind of chasing after the wind. You know, I think we're running out of movies to remake. I mean, we've gotten down to the, le like the, 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 the most ridiculous movies. We've done Aladdin, Lion King, got Beyonce. Now we're gonna start be doing like Aristocats, like making those motion pictures. Like we are in this, this cycle of just reproducing what has already been made. And there's something inside of me that, that just wants to break that cycle. You know, if, if there's ever been a moment or a verse of scripture that I haven't liked, it's, it's this verse of scripture where Solomon says, there is nothing new under the sun. I don't know about you, but I love the Bible. I love God's word. But that verse of scripture bothers me. Does that bother you? Like nothing new under the sun. Like you're not going to do anything that is going to be different from those that have come before you. If there's ever one verse of scripture in the Bible that has challenged me and frustrated me, it's that verse of scripture. Because I've always had this question is, how can I break that cycle being under the sun? How can I move beyond that barrier of limitation where I'm not addicted and consumed with amassing more wealth and amassing more luxuries and amassing more safety and security? How do I break that barrier and be used by God in such a way that I see the environment around me change? That I don't, I'm not just a repeat of history, but I'm actually making history. There's something inside of me that wants to break the cycle. And I can see the frustration that Solomon has because he says, this is the life of being under the sun. And one of the things that we see is this. Solomon begins to say this. If you want to break the cycle of being under the sun, know this, no matter how much we know, we were made for more. Chapter 1, verse 16, Solomon says this. I said to myself, look, I have increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I have experienced much wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly. But I learned that this, too, is chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. Here's the crazy thing about today. We cannot scroll enough to cure the ache that is in our soul and in our world. We are the most knowledgeable generation that has ever been known to be on the face of the planet. They've done recent reports and they said Gen Zers are on track to be the most well-educated generation ever because they were born with a phone in their hand. They have access to all of this knowledge. Did you know that there's degrees of wokeness? I don't know if you know this, but according to a writer by the name of Michael Harriet, there are degrees of wokeness, and there's a level of wokeness where you're asleep. And how do you know you're asleep? Because you may make statements, shouldn't all lives matter? There's a newly woke. You know, you got the woke starter kit. You watched all of the apple-free black movies. That, that's, that you're getting into the place of being woke. And then this, the insomniac. You start locking your hair, you're going vegan. You're like, you can't be woke and eat pork products. And literally you come to this place where you're like, I'm no longer just a, 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 a person, I'm an activist now. And this is, this is, you start saying things like, this is what they want you to think. That's exactly what they want you to think. There's degrees of wokeness. And our search for knowing, Solomon comes to this conclusion, we can never know enough. Because what Solomon is doing is, is this, He's surveying the landscape of life. And he, for some reason, he separate his finite moment. He's extracted the concept of eternity out of it. It's almost he knows that God is watching, but God is not engaged and involved. And I think most people feel that way. And so they feel like the only thing that they can do is make the most of what they have right now. Solomon says... If you want to break the cycle of being under the sun, you can't do it 
but having more. Because no matter how much you have, you are made for more. He's a rapper. Look at this. Ecclesiastes 2, verse 8. It says, I amass silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired male, female singers in harem as well uh, in the delights of a man's heart. This cat was wilding out. I became greater by far, uh, far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. And all of this wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all of my labor, and this was the reward for all my toil. And yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. I'm telling you, you look at the life of Solomon, this guy, he wouldn't have said, Alexa, play Alicia Keys. No, he would have called Alicia Keys and she would have came over to his house and played the keys for Solomon. Solomon says, not only did I amass singers and songwriters, I had studios and and studios and studios and I amassed wealth and gold and jewelry and all of these possessions. And no matter what I had and how much I had, I wanted more, but it was never enough. You want to know something that's crazy is that in the last three months, or the first three months of of 2020, Amazon made $74 billion in three months. Do you know what $74 billion means? Is this, it's $33 million an hour. Some of us are juiced for making $33 an hour, let alone $33 million an hour. Man, Amazon is sitting pretty tight. But the reason why Amazon was so successful is because all of us kept asking for more. (laughs) You know, my daughter, she has this little book back, or book back? (laughs) She has this backpack, and it's a little tiny, cute uh, Minnie Mouse backpack. And at nighttime, what she does is she goes all throughout the house, and she gathers her toys, and she puts it in this backpack right before she goes to bed. It's so cute. It's enduring. And just last night, she went to go put all of her toys in her backpack, and she had got this laptop. And she began to try to shove this laptop into the backpack. And she's trying with everything to the point where literally she just starts crying. And she's like, it won't fit. Dad, I can't put it in there. And I'm like, babe, in order for you to fit that laptop in there, something has to come out. In order for you to live a life that breaks the cycle of being under the sun. It's not always amassing more, but sometimes it's removing the things that distract us and create the chaos in our souls. You see, the thing that Solomon says to us is that if we're going to break the cycle from being under the sun is this. He says, don't despair. Verse 24 says, a person can do nothing better than to eat, drink, and find satisfaction in their own toil. This too, I see, is from the hand of God, for without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? Now, when we read that verse, there's something in of us that's like, that's right. Make the best with what you got. You know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to work hard. I'm going to invite friends over, have a few drinks, find some new recipes, be nice to people, responsible pleasures. And most of us, I would say, that kind of fits our lives. And we just, we want to be good people. We want to, we want to help where we can. But we really want our lives to be comfortable. But there's something inside of me that even when I read that verse of scripture, I kind of lean into it and find safety in it. But then I realize, you know, there's more. There's got to be something more than just accumulating more recipes and more pictures and more images and more posts. There's got to be something more than that. And so what can break the cycle of living under the sun? What can find beauty in the world that is fading? What can find hope in the midst of not knowing who to vote for? What gives us a desire to keep going, to move, to be moved beyond the depression and the anxiety that's running rampant in our lives, in our world? How do we raise our children in an environment where they grow and they look at themselves with hope in their heart? There's got to be something more than just this moment. And that's what Solomon finally concludes in the first two chapters. In the first three chapters of Ecclesiastes, he begins to realize that if I just live for the temporal, I'm dissatisfied. But if I project my life in light of eternity, 
When I begin to see that there's something after this life, when I realize who God is and that what I do in this finite moment can actually carry over into the next and money won't show up in heaven. Good jobs won't show up in heaven. 401ks won't be in heaven. But what I do with what I have right now and if I love people and model the goodness of God, eternity is real. And if we're not careful, we can be so caught up in cancel culture or culture that we want to possess or kingdoms that we want to build for ourselves. And what Solomon is saying to us is the chasing after the wind. There's more to life than eat and drink. There's more to life. And what Solomon begins to say in Ecclesiastes 11 is this. He says, what do we gain? The burden that God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He also set eternity in the human heart. No one can fathom what God has done in the beginning to the end. I know there is nothing better than for people to be happy and to do good while they live. That they can find satisfaction from God. That everything that God creates will endure forever. Nothing can be added. Nothing can be taken away from it. God does it so all people will fear him. It's eternity. That my life has significance when I realize that it's not just about what I possess or how much I know or how woke I am, but the kingdom of God. And as a pastor, I realize that I'm broken in this area. As a pastor who is encouraging you to lift up your eyes and look to God, not the world, not a presidential cabinet, but to look to God, I struggle with keeping eternity on the forefront of my focus. Because just the other day, my daughter came out of the bathroom and she had grabbed like 20 paper towels and she had turned him into a beard. She took 20 paper towels, and she made a beard, and she's like, happy-go-lucky, frolicking in a field of, of unicorns and skittles with this paper towel beard. And in me, I got mad. I said, what are you doing with the paper towels? Just playing, Daddy. Put the paper towels down. And in that moment, it's convicted. Because I wonder... I was looking through the lens of eternity, would I be concerned with paper towels? I wonder in your life, if you were looking through all that you're doing through the lens of eternity, would you realize it's just paper towels? You know, what Corona has taught me is this, and with more situations that have happened in the beginning of launching our church, is that I have few moments and I want to make the most of those moments by loving God and loving people well. And what Solomon did not know is that one day Jesus would come. Jesus would break the cycle under the sun. He goes to this woman who's a Samaritan who literally is ostracized from community and he loves her and he begins to show her that she can break the cycle of sexual perversion and being addicted to relationships that actually have ruined her life. Jesus comes to a centurion and says, you don't have to live just being possessed by political authorities, but that God can be your authority in your life. And Jesus begins to extract people from the monotony. He takes fishermen who literally will have lived their lives just fishing. And he extracts them from being just fishermen to being fishers of men. He removes them out of the monotony. And they don't know much, but Jesus begins to show them revelation upon revelation. They don't have much, but Jesus gives them power, signs, and hope, and healing. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says this, Therefore, whoever is in Christ Jesus is now a new creation. The old has gone, and the new has come. So what Solomon didn't know is that when Jesus gets a hold of your life. He connects you with eternity and he begins to reveal to you how can you use your gifts and your talents and your abilities and your resources in order to see those catch the same glimpse of the love and hope that is in God. Oh, I went in today. John 4, 3, 4, 34, Jesus said this. He says, what satisfies my soul is not how much I know, 
It's not how much I have, but he says this, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me and to finish his work. See, church, I don't want us to live a life of chasing after the wind. And in the next few months, I believe, not even the next few months, in the next few weeks, our church is about to make a radical shift. Our church is about to change the way that we do things, not just in light of pandemics, not just in life of racial division, but we feel like there are things that God is calling us to do to serve our city in a great way and that it is going to cost us. And we believe that this concept of the Dream Center is becoming more and more clear and more and more obvious and more and more available right now. And with that being said, before we even talk about big picture vision and concepts, it starts with you. Maybe right now you're at home and you realize, Pastor Jules, I've become consumed with paper towels. I find myself angry. I find myself in a place of despair. And I'm not sure how much hope I can muster up. But let me tell you something. Eternity is real. People matter most. And, and God wants to, know, wants to know you in a deep relationship. And God wants you to be a part of his family. And if you are far away from God, if you have lived a life where you think that who you are, your identity is associated with a culture, with a theme, with how much you have or don't have, you have to understand that Jesus said when he stretched out his arms, he presented the love of God. And he says, you don't have to live this finite life, but there is something more for you. And Jesus says, in order for you to experience that beauty, that amazing restorative power where God begins to restore your soul and begins to change your desires, your appetite for amassing just possessions, that your appetite begins to come towards God's presence. And if you're far away from God, the Bible says very clearly, you need to surrender to Jesus and follow him. And right now, if you're far away from God, the Bible says that when we come to God, and we ask for forgiveness, we realize that we've sinned. Our greatest sin is that we've taken God's creation and we've looked to it as if it were our creator. And all of us can fall victim of idolatry. Even the church, the building can be its idol. And I think throughout Corona, God has taken every idol, every statue that man would identify, and he has flipped it on its axis. Every football team, every basketball. And I know they're talking about things coming back, but God took God had, had to do something so beyond us. And God is saying, everything that you associated yourself with is out of the way. You don't have to chase the wind anymore. If you're far away from God, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Just say, Father, forgive me. I need you. I don't want to chase the wind. Lord, you've put eternity in my heart. And I want my purpose to be about your presence. Wash me, make me new. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, your next step is to be baptized. And we want you to do that. And for you also, that maybe you're in a place where you, you may not have prayed that prayer, you're a follower of Jesus, but you're saying, you know what, Pastor Jules, I do want to do something for eternity. I, I want to make sure that what I do with my life, how I serve people, how I serve God, it's going to show up because at the end of the day, we will stand before God and God will ask us two questions. What did you do with my son? And what did you do with what I gave you? And we want to share Jesus and we want to share what we have. And I want to ask and invite you to come along with us on this journey as a church and maybe, church, you're at a place where, you know, you, you love God, you're following God, but you haven't taken that next step to really discover your purpose. I want to invite you to come to our Discover class. It's more than a class. It's a, a really an online experience. We get to share our stories and see how God has led us to this moment. But it's also in preparation for you to discover your gifts, for you to take that next step. Because I believe where God is leading TFH Oakland like never before, we're going to do things without walls. We're going to be the church without walls. I feel like God is going to embed us into the community like never before, that we're going to worship together. We're going to call you out of your homes, but we're going to need a team of people that really want to see the trajectory of Oakland change in a real and vibrant way. And I believe that we are standing on the epitus. We are standing on the foundation of great days where God is going to use our church, you, to see eternity placed in the hearts of people. These are exciting days. I know it may seem like you're filled with despair, but I promise you, as we walk together, 
God's going to do incredible things. We love you so much, and we're so excited. And please, please, please take that next step of being a part of discovering, seeing how God wants to use you in, in light of eternity. God bless you guys. We love you so much, and we'll see you next week.